focus in this particular lesson will be on Hosea chapter 7. Please open your Bibles to that chapter in the Old Testament. This particular chapter is unified around a common theme, the frantic, hopeless political intrigue of Ephraim, or Israel, centered in Samaria. The general faithlessness of Israel, their personal sin, passion for political intrigue, and vulnerability in internal affairs, and ultimate destruction, as we're going to see, are all described here. Most, if not all, of the accusations made against decisions and practices that originate in the city of Samaria. The structure of the chapter could be summarized as follows. Verses 1 and 2, we have a lament over the general wickedness of the nation. Then in verses 3 through 7, the focus goes to Samaritan domestic politics among the leadership, and we've seen that already in our study of Hosea. Then thirdly, in verses 8 through 12, we have a lament over Israel's folly in foreign affairs and a judgment sentence because of that. And then the chapter finishes out in verses 13 through 16 with a lament over the doom for Israel's rebellion. Let's start here in chapter 7, verse 1. God says, when I would heal Israel, the iniquity of Ephraim is uncovered and the evil deeds of Samaria, for they deal falsely. The thief enters in, bandits raid outside. So Ephraim here and Samaria are mentioned in tandem as the capital, and Samaria was the capital city of the northern kingdom. Samaria can be spoken of as representative of the northern kingdom as a whole. The phrase here in this verse, they deal falsely, states the general situation of Israel's wickedness, and the following two lines give specific examples, in particular, of the thief entering in and bandits raiding outside. The word falsely carries the sense of acting deceitfully. The deception was rooted in Israel's unfaithfulness to the covenant, while, on the other hand, thinking to honor God with outward religious practices. We saw that back in chapter 6, verse 6, where God says, you know, I desire other things over sacrifice. The twin crimes of breaking and entering and banditry are cited as examples here, emphasizing the blatant nature of the violations. The two crimes are evidence for civil and social injustices in general. God is not lamenting the nation's failure, if you will, to put more police on the streets, but rather the society's toleration of open evils of all sorts while hypocritically maintaining its religious rituals. We see the same thing in the prophet Isaiah's words. Prophet Isaiah chapter 28 verse 15 reads this way. Because you have said we have made a covenant with death and with Sheol we have made a pact. The overwhelming scourge will not reach us when it passes by. For we have made falsehood our refuge and have concealed ourselves with deception. <clears throat> so again, Hosea here in chapter 7 verse 1 highlighting the fact that Israel's dealing falsely and every prophet it seems like in one manner or another brings this up jeremiah does as well in chapter 6 verse 13 jeremiah says for from the east from the rather from the least of them even to the greatest of them everyone is greedy for gain and from the prophet even to the priest everyone deals falsely all right verse 2 of chapter 7 hosea 7 verse 2 says and they do not consider in their hearts that i remember all their wickedness now their deeds are all around them. They are before my face. God speaking here. And the stress here in verse 2 continues upon the openness of the nation's sins. Ephraim, or Israel's guilt, is not hidden. God has washed it all. When it says here in the New American Standard, they do not consider in their hearts, it just means simply that they, they're not thinking. No emphasis is placed on introspection. The fact that Israel is unconcerned with its behavior reflects the influence of the pagan Canaanite religion around them, which allowed for a personally indulgent ethical system. You see the surrounding religions, if you will, this is the way they did it. As long as they offered their sacrifices, the God didn't, God necessarily didn't care how they acted. And that's bled over now into this syncretism they have in trying to honor God. Deuteronomy 32 verse 29 there it says, would that they were wise, that they understood this, that they would discern their future. Again, it's the idea, just think about what you're doing. Isaiah 5 verse 12 reads, their banquets are accompanied by lyre and height and harp, by tambourine 
and flute and by wine, but they do not pay attention to the deeds of the Lord, nor do they consider the work of their hands. Again, taking care of all the, these other insignificant details, but yet they're not thinking about God. They're not considering in their hearts what God would have them to do. But even if Israel did not remember God's revelation, they certainly did remember their sin. These evil ways are now so rife as to surround Israel, the people's iniquity being, if you will, in God's face. There at the end of verse 2, it says, God says, they are before my face. As God looks at Israel, he sees not people but sins, filling his field of vision as it were. It's as if God says, when I look at them, all I can see is their sins. That's the sense of the second part of verse 2. In Jeremiah 14, verse 10, it says, thus says the Lord to this people, even so they have loved to wonder, they have not kept their feet in check. Therefore, the Lord does not accept them. Now he will remember their iniquity and call their sins to account. Jesus himself said in his own ministry, he says, there's nothing covered up that will not be revealed and hidden that will not be known. So this sense of Israel thinking they're getting away with something and hiding something before God, it's, it's not true. In Hebrews 4.13, the Hebrew writer says, There is no creature hidden from his sight, but all things are open and laid bare to the eyes of him with whom we have to do. So again, think about it. Israel should have thought and considered in their hearts that God remembers their wickedness. He sees their evil deeds, and, and they will have to reckon with that. All right, let's look at verse 3, Hosea 7, verse 3. With their wickedness, they make the king glad and their princes with their lies. Attention now centers on the political leadership of Israel, royalty, appointed officials, and the such. There is no, though there is no formal break between verses two and three, the subject is more specific. For example, again, kings and those in a, with influence in the affairs of the royal court. The sort of wickedness and lies the ver, that verse three addresses are those of the political conspirators whose plotting has brought kings and therefore their chosen officials to power. The description here, it may, God here may be just referring to uh, all the kings that came to power via uh, being power, usurping power after 752 BC. After Jeroboam II, there was a succession of assassinations and political machinations of people coming to power and being dethroned. Uh, the political situation among the nation was incredibly evil. Four, in fact, of the last kings of Israel were assassinated. In 1 Kings, you can read about it in 1 Kings 22, verse 6. It says then, and this is just a, a biblical record of the time we're just studying in Hosea, it says, then the king of Israel gathered the prophets together, about 400 men, and said to them, Shall I go up against Ramoth Gilead to battle, or shall I refrain? And they said, go up, for the Lord will give it into the hand of the king. And of course, here's Ahab, and this is just an example from 1 Kings 22 of what, what's happening here in Hosea, verse 3 of chapter 7. And it says, with their wickedness, they make the king glad, and with the princes, their lies. You know, the king of Israel was surrounded by yes men here, 400 prophets would say, yes, do what you say you want to do, King. And then, of course, we get down to verse 13 of 1 Kings 22, and it's the Judah king that asks, isn't there somebody here, a prophet of God, that might offer, if you will, a, a counter view? And, of course, it's Micaiah, and Ahab says, oh, I don't like him. He never says good things about me. But anyway, 1 Kings twenty two thirteen 13 says, Then the messenger who went to summon Micaiah spoke to him, saying, Behold now, the words of the prophets are uniformly favorable to the king. Please let your word be like one of them and speak favorably. So there's the pressure, right? Tell the king what he wants to hear. Lie if you have to. Make the king glad. That was going on in the time of Hosea. Jeremiah 37, verse 19, Jeremiah was dealing with it. it it asks there, it says, then where then are the are your prophets who prophesied to you, saying the king of Babylon will not come against you or this land? So Jeremiah is asking an important question. All your yes men are telling you Babylon won't come, and I'm here telling you he will. 
And also in Micah chapter 7, verse 3, that prophet says, Concerning evil, both hands do it well. The prince asks, also the judge, for a bribe. And a great man speaks to the desire of his soul, so they weave it together. So once again, we've got this political intrigue among the leadership. And again, that's just about as real as the newspaper you can read today of all the political plottings and uh, you know, behind closed doors agreements that was going on in Israel in their day. All right, let's look at verse 4, Hosea 7, 4. God says, they are all adulterers, like an oven heated by the baker who ceases to stir up the fire from the kneading of the dough until it's leavened. So the adulterers here, and we've seen it already in Hosea, it's a phrase or description used to express covenant infidelity or unfaithfulness, is here also a pun on the word to bake in verse 4 and anger in verse 6, words which sound very simil similar to it in Hebrew. The passion of the king here, and this is the point of this description about baking, the passion of the king, his core officials, and their influential nobility is likened to a baker's oven so hot that the baker need not tend the fire during the entire baking process. And so the, their passion for these bribes and, and this, this evil among the leadership, the heat of their treachery and transgression drives them to take matters into their own hands, ignoring God in all of their maneuvering. This will become even more clear as we work through verses five through seven in just a moment, moment here. But the figure of verse four that we just read depicts, if you will, a superheated oven built with a great fire that would continue from the time the dough was kneaded until yeast, with its yeast, until it had risen to be put into the oven. Later, when the coals were red hot and the walls were glowing. Again, you usually had to tend the fire to kind of keep it up to temperature. Well, here, just like the, the leadership's passions, it was red hot. Didn't have to stoke this fire. So were Samaria's leaders. They had come to power by the heat of their treachery and violent upheavals, but certainly not by God's will. All right, verse 5. It says, On the day of our king, the princes became sick with the heat of wine. He stretched out his hand with the scoffers. It's likely here this phrase, the day of the king, speaks of a festive occasion, perhaps the coronation day of this particular king referred to. The officials here are depicted as feverishly hot from drunkenness, thus eagerly friendly, even to those who scoff at religious faith. Fueled by alcohol, the brain can better suppress conscience and entertain wickedness, depravity, and conspiring with scoffers. That's the danger the Bible puts on drunkenness. You don't think clearly. You suppress the conscience and you may do something you wouldn't normally do. When it says he stretched out his hand, this can make reference to making an agreement with or participation, i.e. sharing an evil, or perhaps, again, it could be either way. It still would be counter to what God wants. So when it says he stretches out his hand, again, maybe they're doing it together, or maybe they're just, uh, you know, giving uh, encouragement to those who do. Either way, it's not what God would have them to do. Verse 6 says, for their hearts are like an oven as they approach their plotting. Their anger smolders all night. In the morning it burns like a flaming fire. This verse reinforces the point of the metaphor or figure of speech in verses 4 through 7. The governmental leaders are utterly consumed by their desire for power. Asleep or awake, they are never free from the flame of passion for intrigue. The horrible destructive force of this passion drives them even to the assassination of royalty. When it says their anger smolders all night, once again, this picture of an oven. Usually an oven was not fired up at night, right? Did it's baking during the day. But the coals were kept alive in the oven so that a newly laid fire in the morning would catch and reheat the oven again the following day. Samaria's leaders are likened to that fire. Only when they're asleep, only when they're asleep, rather, does the fury of their emotional frenzy die down somewhat. Their waking hours, however, are devoted to mischief against God's will. 
in Micah 2, verse 1, it says, Woe to those who scheme iniquity, who work out evil on their beds. When morning comes, they do it, for it is in the power of their hand. So again, the anger of these leaders smoldering all night, and they'd get up and it would uh, burst into flame in their practices. Verse 7, Hosea 7, verse 7. All of them, it says, are, like, are hot like an oven. And they consume their rulers. All their kings have fallen. None of them calls on me. Like verse 4, verse 7 begins with all of them as its subject. And thus the entire governmental structure and those with political influence are condemned. The point of the frequent mention of the fury of the government's leaders is now revealed explicitly. They have come to power by devouring, or if you will, killing off, consuming their rulers. No single assassination here is in view, but then only one king, Menahem, has not been assassinated since the death of Jeroboam II. The intrigue of northern politics in Israel's last days was marked by its fierce intensity. Speaking of these self-appointed rulers and their cohorts by the third person, all of them, they, et cetera, as you see here, it says, God disassociates himself from their intrigues. Israel's affairs of state have been carried along by the feverish hotness of a selfish, godless lust for national control. As God says, none of them calls on me in the, in the heat of these problems. The nation's self-centeredness is painfully aware or evident in the final statement. The lament of Israel's only true sovereign is both plaintive and bitter. Not a one of them calls on me. If they'd only sought God, he would have gladly helped them, I believe, but they are so arrogant and egotistical that they paid no attention. When we get into chapter 8, verse 4, God says, They have set up kings, but not by me. They have appointed princes, but I did not know it. When their silver and with their silver and gold, they have made idols for themselves that they might be cut off. Isaiah 43, verse 22 says, Yet you have not called on me, O Jacob but you have become weary of me, O Israel. All right, let's read on in verse 8, Hosea 7, verse 8. Ephraim mixes himself with the nations. Ephraim has become a cake not turned. So difficulties with foreign politics inevitably lead to these civil internal upheavals. The verse here describes Israel's weakness and vulnerability. The nation is mixed up and half-baked, if you will. In a literal sense, Israel was, or Ephraim was intermixed with the nations. Israel's struggle for survival in its last two decades in the face of increasing Assyrian threats was characterized by frantic policy, foreign policy shifts, especially or particularly between the successive alliances with Assyria and Egypt, but also some with Syria, Damascus, and Philistia. All of this represented a failure to trust God, as we just saw in verse 7, and an unwillingness to return to him. We'll get to that in verse 10. The King Hoshea's lurching foreign policy is, is an illustration of it. In 732 BC, BC Hoshea, after killing Pekka, suddenly shifted alliance from, with Egypt, Philistia, and Damascus to alliance with, with Assyria. A few years later, he broke that alliance, and coming virtually full circle again, he sought alliance once again with Egypt. These confused policies are caricatured by the figurative sense of mixed up, right? Ephraim mixes himself with the nations. In Psalm 106, verses 34 through 36, it says they did not, and this is again the root of the problem here, they didn't destroy the peoples when they first come into the land, as God told them to do. It says they did not destroy the peoples as the Lord commanded them, but they mingled with the nations and learned their practices and served their idols, which became a snare to them. The phrase right here at the end of verse 8, where it says Ephraim has become a cake not turned, that's a vivid picture. And again, it carries on this oven imagery, baking. Israel has become like a flat loaf not turned over. According to the usual explanation, the bread loaves pressed onto the hot oven walls or laid among the coals needed turning after a time. If left unturned, they would be just half-baked, crusty or burnt on one side, and yet doughy perhaps on the other. 
In a similar way, Israel was rigid and crusty toward God, but its soft underbelly was exposed to the nations that it sought to make alliances with, like an unturned loaf that lacked both the strength and consistency to survive. However, no evidence exists uh, to a suggestion that suggests a turning process was ever used in baking. Either way, more likely the tur turning here refers to doubling the dough over for strength and compactness as opposed to weakness from thinness. Anyway, poor quality would result from the failure to handle the bread here in the right way. And poor quality is, of course, what Ephraim or Israel is now being characterized by. Verse 9, strangers devour his strength, yet he does not know it. Gray hairs are also sprinkled on him, yet he does not know it. So at Israel's invitation, these foreign nations, by alliance, made debilitating inroads into Israel's national and religious life. Payment for this foreign assistance would sap Israel's strength and make her old and feeble without them even noticing it. I think that's what's being pictured here. In chapter 8 of Hosea, verse 7, it says, they sow the wind and they reap the whirlwind. That's what's happened with these alliances, foreign alliances. The standing grain has no heads. It yields no grain. Should it yield, strangers would swallow it up. So this going to other nations for help is going to backfire. Both parts of verse 9 here end identically. And it says, he, speaking of Israel, does not know it. Israel does not know how weak and vulnerable that it's become. Israel, now debilitated, if you with with age, that's the sense here of this gray hairs, it's just highlighting the fact that Israel was in its last decade of existence. But who were the foreigners who had sapped Israel's vitality? More likely, most likely, they must be identified with all the nations Israel mixed in with after the year, in the years after 745. Once again, Assyria, Egypt, Syria, Damascus, Philistia, and even Judah, chapter 5, verses 8 through 10. War and its aftermath, ma aftermath left the nation reduced in population, territory, and economic vitality. Many Israelite territories were now Assyrian provinces, heavy Assyrian tribute as well, as presumably gifts to Egypt and the taxes imposed to provide them. It drained the wealth and the royalty, the temple and the citizenry. In the late 730s and early 720s, the north, northern kingdom was dying. And yet, again, the saddest thing of all, as it says in verse 9, they, they didn't even realize it. They didn't know it. The once great nation was like a ruined loaf of bread, fit only for casting aside. Verse 10, Hosea 7, verse 10. Though the pride of Israel testifies against him, yet they have not returned to the Lord their God nor have they sought him for all this. The verse begins with a saying also used back in chapter 5, verse 5, where again, this idea of Israel's pride testifying against him. The similar context occasioned the identical saying. Just as in chapter 5, verses 4 through 6, now Israel, mixed up and half-baked, also refuses to return to God or seek him. It is too late, really, for Israel. Their death is near. Again, what we just saw in verse 9. Arrogance or pride keeps a person from turning to God because arrogance claims no need of help from anyone, human or divine. Pride intensifies all our other sins because we cannot repent of any of them without first giving up our pride. That's the problem. Israel's pride is bred a stubbornness here that cuts them off from God's blessings. Here God speaks of himself in the third person as a means of contrast to Israel's faith in everything but God. The Israelites habitually trust in other sources of potential relief, relief other than their own God. They are like an old man, blissfully ignorant of how decrepit he has become. And I need talking about the glory days, right? Who needs God, says Israel in effect. Why turn to him? Our greatness will see us through once again. Even in their decline, their pride was getting in the way. In spite of all this, it says there, nor have they sought him for all this. In spite of all this, the serious deterioration of Israel's position among the nations, Israel stubbornly keeps independent of its covenant God. Verse 11. So Ephraim has become like a silly dove without sense. They call to Egypt. They go to Assyria. In Hosea's day, Israel's foreign policy flip-flopped between these 
uh, foreign loyalties. God here likens them to a pigeon or dove, depending on your, your version, but it's a bird not known for its wit. Compare Matthew 10, verse 16 on that. But again, you read the history of these times, and again, very, very turmoil, full of turmoil, without sense. What a pigeon Israel was, tricked, deceived, gullible, brainless, an easy mark for the nations to devour, as we saw in verse 9, and ripe for punishment, as we're going to see in verse 12 in just a moment. Egypt and Assyria could not possibly help the covenant people when the real source of their problem was their guilt before God. All right, verse 12. When they go, God says, I will spread my net over them. I will bring them down like the birds of the sky. I will chastise them in accordance with the proclamation to their assembly. So the bird metaphor here leads into a description of the judgment God will bring upon Israel. With his bird hunting net, he's going to catch Israel winging its way to these foreign nations for help. The resulting captivity will represent Israel's own downfall as a nation. The destruction we'll talk about in verse 13. The sense here in verse 12, when God says, I will chastise them, that's a word in the original, it just speaks of discipline, instruction, or admonishment. We see it used in places like Jeremiah 2, verse 30, where God says, in vain I have struck your sons, they accepted no chastening. Your sword has devoured your prophets like a destroying lion. Then in Jeremiah 7, 28, it says, you shall say to them, this is the nation that did not obey the voice of the Lord their God or accept correction or chastening. Truth has perished and has been cut off from the land. I'm also reminded of the words of the risen Lord to one of the seven churches of Asia in Revelation chapter 3, verse 19. There, Jesus says, those whom I love, I reprove and discipline. Therefore, be zealous and repent. Back in Hosea 7, verse 12, God is chastising them in hopes of their repentance all right verse 13 woe to them for they have strayed from me god says destruction is theirs for they have rebelled against me i would redeem them but they speak lies against me so the divine rebuke now openly becomes a cry of woe a predictive sort of lament announcing destruction in ancient israel this word woe was originally a mournful cry at the death of a loved one or lamentably about oneself in a situation of mortal peril. The prophets used it as a means of signaling disaster for Israel or perhaps another nation. It implies the inevitability of calamity and it is appropriate to situation where one's doom is certain. And that's certainly the case here in Hosea's day for the northern kingdom. Woe is me, woe is them rather, God says, for they've strayed from me. Hosea 9 verse 12 says, God says, though they bring up their children, yet I will bereave them until not a man is left. Yes, woe to them indeed when I depart from them. Isaiah 31 verse 1, Isaiah says, woe, woe to those who go down to Egypt for help. Again, that's our context in in Hosea 7, isn't it? Woe to those who go down to Egypt for help and they rely on horses and trust in chariots because they are many and in horsemen because they are very strong and they do not look to the Holy One of Israel nor seek the Lord. I'm reminded of how often Jesus used this same phrase, like in several times in Matthew 23. Let's just look at verse 13. Jesus says to the leadership of his day, but woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, because you shut off the kingdom of heaven from people, for you do not enter in yourselves, nor do you allow those who are entering to go in. <clears throat> so upon Israel, this woe was now pronounced because it had strayed from, as it says in verse 13. They'd strayed from and rebelled against God. The latter term implies revolt against authority, as in a revolution against a king or empire, because Israel had transgressed the divine law, the Lord must punish the rebellious nation as the law specified. In the last part of verse 13 here of Hosea 7, God expresses his lack of options. God says, I would redeem them, but they speak lies against me. It's, it's like God saying, how can I redeem them when they are lying about me? The lies Israel had spoken about God are be identified with the broken promises to keep the covenant. 
Israel's oaths of, of fidelity or faithfulness during the yearly festivals were proven false by the reliance on other superpowers. Their loyalty to God proved to be fleeting. Verse 14. And they do not cry to me, God says, from their heart when they wail on their beds. For the sake of new grain and new wine, they assemble themselves. They turn away from me. This verse describes how Israel how the Israelites cry out, perhaps in the course of their sacrifices, but without true loyalty. Isaiah 29, verse 13, reads this way. Then the Lord said, because of this, because rather this people draw near with their words and honor me with their lip service, but they remove their hearts far from me, their reverence for me consists of tradition learned by rote. Zechariah 7, 5 adds to it. It says, say to all the people of the land and to the priest, when you have fasted and mourned, in the fifth and seventh months, these 70 years, was it actually for me that you fasted? So once again, that's the point here for Israel in Hosea's day. The northern kingdom was now in difficult straits, not at least, not the least agriculturally. It mentions here, for the sake of new grain and new wine, uh, they appealed to God. Their beds, in this case, and it may be a, a reference here to these pagan worship type things. Canaanite worship involved the sacrificial meal eaten at leisure while reclining on cushions beside the altar. See that in Amos 2 verse 8 and Isaiah 57 verses 7 through 12. Upon these beds, if you will, it, the Israelites cried out in a sincere but covenantally worthless attempt to invoke God's help in these hard times. Now, you know, now they're hitting dire times and they're appealing to God, but uh, why are they just turning to him now? Verse 15, God says, although I trained and strengthened their arms, yet they devise evil against me. God raised Israel. Chapter 11, verse 1, we'll see that later. But God raised Israel. He taught and strengthened them. He had his protection or they had his protection and guidance. And yet they rebelled. God did everything necessary to strengthen and provide, but they rebelled. Israel is now likened, in effect, to a stubborn child, a rebellious, wanton child, impossible to discipline. The punishment, of course, under the old law in Deuteronomy 21, verses 18 through 20, was, was death. Israel's stubbornness manifested itself in plotting against God. For example, being disobedient to him by attaching themselves to Egypt, Assyria, or anyone else. It may also be that this general reference to their plotting evil against him would include the disloyalty of the illegal Bethel cult, and the Baal worship, which characterized some of the Norse religion. Verse 16, final verse of the chapter. God says they turn, but not upward. They are like a deceitful bow. Their princes will fall by the sword. Because of the insolence of their tongue, this will be their derision in the land of Egypt. The lament here concludes with a description of the punishment evil Israel, rather, will receive for its rebellion against God. Captivity, helplessness, and death in war. Against the Samaritan leadership is particularly, again rather, the Samaritan leadership is particularly, though not exclusively, the focus. The idea here of, of a deceitful bow provides an analogy of, of weakness and ineffectiveness. The bow is unstrung or has no tension so that no arrow can be shot from it. It's a worthless weapon in war, and that's what Israel's become. For all of its frantic attempts at shoring up its position militarily and politically, the northern kingdom is deathly weak and exposed helplessly to the, among the nations that surround them, ripe for the plucking by Assyria whose practices of subjugation, captivity, and deportation were well known to Hosea's northern audience, as well as to his southern readership as well. Neither hearer nor reader could fail to miss the point of these words. The general destruction and subjection of Israel will continue, will constitute rather the source of the Egyptian mockery against Israel. They will take delight in seeing a fickle, unreliable ally done in by the very nation it sought help from in preference to Egypt. Such a prediction would be especially appropriate at a time when Israel was once again contemplating turning to Egypt. In the early 20s, you can read, uh, 
or at least seven twenties, second Kings chapter 17 verses 34, three and four rather, not only will the Egyptians not be able to help them against Assyria, they will end up laughing at them because thereby fulfilling the curse of Deuteronomy 28, 37, that says you will become an object of scorn and ridicule to all the nations where God will drive you. All right. Thank you for participating in this study. Take some time if you need to go back through the video. And uh, I know I went through some of it pretty quickly, had a lot to cover, but I encourage you to look it over again, read through the chapter again, and Lord willing, we'll pick up in our study next time in Hosea 8. God bless.